Hi, Zach and Sid. How are you? Good. Doing great. Right. Welcome to the Women Waken podcast. It's great. Well, to be thank here. you. <laughs> Sid, I'm in your studio right now. <laughs> it's your beautiful home, your beautiful cooperative home. The big reveal. Yeah, I've exposed you. It's wonderful. Well, thanks. We have an extended time to visit. It's nice that we can fit this in as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Sid and Zach, you guys work together in the Seattle Cooperative Housing Network. And Sid, you and I met back in, oh my gosh, 2010, over a decade ago, when I was living here in Seattle and you were working at U UW, University of mm -hmm. Washington. Yes. But you had, even when you were working there, you had already sort of started working within the intentional co-op community, right? Yeah, there's been a role of, you know, facilitating and networking and putting on events for intentional communities since maybe 89, wow. 88, 89, yeah. Look at you. Okay, so then- Being on boards. To sum up for the audience, for those who might not be very keen to what that this means, can you explain what are intentional communities, what are co-ops, and why did you get involved in them? What's the importance of them? Because they are super important, and I see them as being a big part of our future. So I'd love for you to... Well, I can I can start out, and I'll, I definitely want Zachary to add his point. Um, perspective on this too, but when having been a board member of the Fellowship for Intentional Community now is called Foundation for Intentional Community, and we put out a directory and it was the first time in a couple decades at least that we knew of that there'd been any print resource, a directory of intentional communities that really covered all of North America and in fact some uh, around the globe. Anyway, our view of Intentional community was it's an umbrella term for all sorts of cooperative groups trying to live out and um, be in integrity with cooperative culture values. And some of those are student co-ops and some are renter collectives and some are communes and some are mixed economy land holdings that have, you know, from, it could be even two people with a vision, but, um, any size, it really was more self-defined. If you see yourself as this, then you're in it. And it's always a blurry blend. You know, there's always existing some alternative um, intentional communities on the edges of the mainstream culture. But basically I like to think of it as whoever is really trying to enhance their skills in cooperation and sharing, that is kind of a fit. And then there's all sorts of legal structures that can fit under that. Do you wanna to add to that, Zach? I mean, I think you covered a lot of the main points. I also say it's an umbrella term and like it runs the gamut from, you know, a house of four or five friends who has just decided to be in community together and have maybe have weekly dinners or, or regular meetings to discuss uh, the house culture to, like you said, full-blown communes, you know, maybe you're self-sufficient and you have, you know, a couple hundred acres. Uh, away or eco-villages. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the, like you said, sort of the key, the key point is that you are intentional about being in community together, sort of in the name, uh, and that you're making an effort to uh, support each other and be there, there for each other in ways that go beyond sort of our atomic independent expectation in this day and age. Yeah, and I, I, I want to be sure to point out that some are spiritual and religious in nature, their focus and others are not, but it has some core shared values. And so the practice of living out those intentions or demonstrating those values is the key. And sometimes we had heard that, especially because my background is in the fellowship for intention, or I mean, not only the fellowship, but originally even before that, the Federation of Egalitarian Communities, and those are secular, and they tend to have a big voice these days. You know, like 150 years ago, it would be predominantly when people thought of intentional community, oh yeah, the Quakers and the Shakers and the Mennonites and the, you know, whatever kinds of things that were religious oriented. But um, so they, they coexist. We do have some communication and cooperation with each other. Um, Communities Magazine is still a good resource for that. But um, 
yeah, so they're not always someone, you know, some people will think, oh, it's a cult and they're always led by one charismatic leader or something. Well, often not, and especially with co-housing and um, sociocracy and consensus where everybody has a part in the decision-making and there's not one key leader. There's still maybe one or a few founders that have a certain degree of respect and sway in the community, but um, more and more communities are trying to practice a very democratic form of decision-making in this shared living experiment. Yeah. And then would you all say, because I, I mean, the general ideas that you're speaking of make me think of more times where we lived more in villages or, you know, still existing societies and communities that live within, you know, villages, within stronger communities that are more, um, you know, interdependent, they work together and they share resources. And, you know, I think we talked about in our sort of our intro call a few weeks ago about how, you know, people who might not understand or haven't been in an intentional community, they can, to relate it to their own life, they can look back to when they were in college or if they've ever lived with roommates. And that's just like a smaller example of what you guys are trying to do at a higher level, which is just when you live with other people, you have to be more mindful, right? You're more mindful of how you affect other people, how you exist in your environment, how each other, you know, how you work together to create the environment you want. Um, you can share resources, you can share ideas, you can work, you know, collaboratively, a collaborative, right? So I think I asked two questions, but yeah, it's kind of like, so I think people have an idea already, even if they don't, they're not pursuing an intentional community, they might've already kind of been within one, but then are, do you feel like it's something that we're trying to create in a different way? Or are we trying to kind of bring back that village mentality? Zach? Uh, I mean, it depends. It's a little bit of both. Like, you know, the world looks a lot different than it did 150 years ago. Villages might not make as much sense. A lot of people want to live in cities for good reasons, but I still think there's a lot of space to form like local groups within cities. Um, and we see these in places like Madrid that are starting to promote walkable neighborhoods as a way of organizing municipalities. And I think there's a lot of merit into that, having that sort of uh, uh, way of organizing city life and having chunks of neighborhoods with a mixed use apartments and shops where people can just know, the, their, know their neighbors and walk around and have common spaces that they can be in and sort of work and live in one contained area that might still be part of a city. You can still go to museums and sports centers and, and all the like artistic things that you'd want to and enjoy about a city life, but you don't necessarily have to like travel, commute an hour every day for your job. You can work and live and interact with the same people uh, in, in your neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it is good to also point that out that it's not away from everything else you know there's rural and there's urban and communities tend to not be isolated um, or don't want to be even those who choose to want to have like a agricultural focus or um, rural life as as their ideal that um, that setting is one way and also many that are urban or suburban even now um, and but everything is more human scale it's, you know, what's living within our means, what is, what can we collectivize, what things we want to keep privatized. Um, and the, the, it just allows for, you know, if someone wants to be doing something that um, you need to have the space to like raise sheep or goats and, you know, uh, or do a particular kind of art or just particularly grow crops and some people want to do that and then there are other people that's like I have no interest or skills in that arena and we want to have a different focus but we really value the social and the um the kind of you know when I first the cultural microcosm that we can create by living together intentionally so a lot of us when we were in college and I'll say that was really my first experience is living in an off-campus house and seeing you know we've been raised in a very hierarchical culture we've had everybody telling us what to do our parents our teachers and whatnot and living in a house <clears throat> where we are figuring out like well what do we want it to just be set up like and it's physical you know 
way that in the built environment we deal with that and what whose furniture and what way and are we all going to cook together where do we you know we collectivize or we can have impact to you know make our purchases and buy food from say this place like the co-op or whatever it is and you realize you have power to form and make tangible your immediate environment. And then that is kind of automatically, if you're thinking permaculture or social permaculture, it's starting from like zero, wherever you are and what are the important fields radiating out that you wanna have the most contact with, most influence over and whatever we influence it's also influencing us back. So you just realize these choices. And then to me, that kind of jumps to the psychological growth or social emotional growth or spiritual growth, whatever you want to call. Um, and that was really what attracted me. So it wasn't just like what this place was or what the buildings look like, but coming together with people and connecting with them and the power of creating environments, which then create the culture, our life ways, what we do every day ends up being like the life we create. Yeah, absolutely. And what you described reminds me of, because you described a symbi symbiotic relationship, right? How you affect and, you know, express mm -hmm. yourself is also, it, it's how the your environment then influences us yeah, and the social. And I think that, that that's powerful because I, we've gotten very detached from that. You know, mm -hmm. and, people you know, are raised with super hyper individualism. Yeah. Yes. They think that. And so inter interpersonally, like with other people, they're like, well, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And like every man for himself kind of mentality. But it also hearkens to our relationship with nature, which we are very disconnected from yeah. the idea that, you know, we think that we can just, you know, go all around and do what we want to the earth and just, you know, plumage and pilgrimage and do what we want and, and not think about the effects uh, that we have. And we're not even that mindful of all that nature gives to us, right? Like we wouldn't be here if the the earth wasn't producing food for us and the trees weren't producing oxygen for us, but we don't think about that very often. Where I feel like our, you know, our ancestors, the farther back we went, they were much more attuned and aware of how much, you know, nature and such affected and impacted our lives, right? I mean, yeah, I think they had to be the more that we had infrastructure that could be a buffer and a barricade between us and nature, then you forget, you forget that intimate relationship that allows us, like you say, to eat or to breathe. Wow. Um, and thus we try to bring it to that human scale again. And um, I mean, I say we, I'm speaking for groups that I've been in and the ideal or common mentality in, communities are in cooperative living is that we are here, we realize, um, you know, not everybody is like ecology minded and um, focused on just the relationship with nature. But I think automatically when you learn about reciprocity with another person or group of people, you it enhances the ability to recognize and then appreciate and perhaps do more about your relationship that is with nature at large. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I, I personally, you know, think is so important about people, at least if they're not, maybe they're not ready for it yet. Maybe they've gotten really used to living on their own or they have their, you know, their single family, but just being aware of the value of intentional communities and shared living and the, and the reason why it's valuable, right? The reason that it's, because, you know, I, I personally have heard a lot, especially recently, you know, I'm on the road, I'm traveling. Now I've made it to visit you, Sid, which is wonderful. And was visiting a few friends along the way who are all experiencing this struggle to to find a family home anymore. I mean, prices just keep going up. The market's, you know, sort of very um, volatile <clears throat> up and down. And I mean, there's a lot of people who can't afford rent anymore in a lot of right. states, in a lot of cities, because a, the discrepancy of wealth, right, is allowing for some people to be able to go and get whatever they want, and others can't even afford a one bedroom place for themselves. Right. So alternative housing is important to consider more and more every year, every decade. Yeah, that's a good place to bring us back to the reason for an uh, urban network like the Seattle Cooperative Housing Network. And so, just to um, make some space for Zach, what drew you to live in community and how? was it when like before you heard about 
the Facebook group or that there had been groups that had these mixers. Um, how did you find cooperative housing? I mean, honestly, like you, I had my first intentional housing experiences in college. We had, you know, theme floors and I was on a theme floor <laughs> and that really like the ability to be around people in the morning and the night and passing and just sort of have that ambient community and connection, having collisions, natural organic collisions with people uh, was really compelling to me. Uh, coming out of a, you know, single family, two parent standalone house. Uh, so I knew that there was something I wanted out there. Uh, I didn't quite have the term intentional communities for it. Um, but I lived with some other people post college and then through another community I'm a part of the effective altruism community. They ran a group house uh, in Seattle, they still run one. Uh, and I lived there pre pandemic, and then you know, like many houses during the pandemic, the group encountered some difficulties with each other and decided to split up. But by that time, like through that community, I'd found the terminology of intentional community uh, and found my way to the Facebook page when I was looking for somewhere to, to go from there. And really just since the first experience, uh, I have never wanted to not live in an intentional community after that. Uh, I think, yeah, like, a lot of people are are really lonely these days or like don't feel like they have enough social ties either in strong or weak forms and intentional communities provide a lot of structure and scaffolding for forming those like there's a, a certainly I'm sure you said have experienced a lot of you know what it means to get to know someone over morning coffee when you're both in the kitchen or late at night when you both come back from something and you just want to chat for a few minutes with someone I definitely love to hear more about what intentional communities have meant to you and why you've, like, you've been in this for arguably longer than I've been alive. So I'm very curious to hear uh, about some of those experiences. Yeah, I could talk about some um, examples as we go along, but I wanted to just make sure we're like touching on the benefits of, um, and particularly right now a little bit with um, this issue of rental or buying, what does it mean to have a home? And I know, Zach, don't let us forget about bringing up the concept of family and related and non-related people maybe living together. Um, the cost is the thing that Whitney brought up and that is a number one draw for many people that are looking to maybe purchase a house with a friend or brother or sister or somebody else because it's just so hard to do on your own. And then even with the rental market, market rate stuff is so high that I've been able to save and have more freedom to do other things and not feel either compelled to work more hours or a corporate job that I might not really find that appealing and have um, with lowered housing rates, um, more options about ways to spend my money. Um, there's also the thing about we touched on sociability, about not being lonely. And it's not only for extroverts either. Introverts can totally make their boundaries and you can have, you know, whether it's house sharing or living in your own unit that you own and totally control in something like co-housing. Community is really for all types of personalities. So it's not just for like, I wanna be around people all the time. I love it, I love, it. no, it's like we, we all take our space and People have different levels of sociability, but at least there's more opportunity for real meaningful connection when you want it and uh, avoiding loneliness. Also very hand in hand with that is the security that if you live in a place where there's a lot of people coming and going and eyes on the commons, um, it's more safe for persons and property rather than for someone who goes away for many hours in a day is hardly ever there. Um, in an urban setting and the kind of disparity and um, desperateness of other people who don't have a home, people are watching those saying like, that kind of looks like an abandoned house. Like maybe we want to break in, maybe we want to try to squat. I don't know what, but I'm just saying that a lot of people all around um, seem to have more problems with crime, but where I've lived in group houses, we seem to not have that problem and co-housers say that that's a big factor for them too, rather than them feeling isolated and 
either living alone where they feel personally afraid or their property is much more of a target, um, we have increased safety and security in community. What's some of the other benefits that you wrote down, Whitney? Am I missing? Yeah, well, there's definitely the, I mean, I think the loneliness part is important. I think that people probably saw that a lot during the pandemic, right? When yeah. all of a sudden we were all just like, frozen wherever we were, like wherever our housing was, like we're stuck there. And for those who lived alone, you know, you might've not seen anybody. And, you know, just like Zach was talking about, like, there's a lot to like seeing people in the morning and the end of your day and having people that you share your, the stories of your day with and your life with. And, and loneliness is, um, you know, it's an epidemic. In right. There was a statistic that came out that some statistics that a notable, I don't know if it was like Johns Hopkins or something was really notable, pushing out a research finding that loneliness, especially, um, I don't know if they had an age group, but I'm, I'm thinking of seniors, that's a chronic loneliness thing, but loneliness in general can be so bad for your health. It's the equivalent of smoking like five cigarettes a day. Yeah. That's an amazing statistic. Absolutely. You know, it's detrimental. it's detrimental to our health to yeah. experience and incur so much loneliness. And what's, what's just interesting to me is that two of the, because really these contribute to our, our physical health, emotional yeah. and mental, because everything All connected, everything does is connected, but it really impacts your physical health too, to be lonely. People don't think about that. They're, they think, well, you know, it's fine. This is just, you know, interaction isn't going to affect me, but it does. It's important. And so the interesting thing to me is that um, loneliness, but also stress are two of the greatest yeah. factors of health. And those are, Good point. Our, those are of our own creation in the society we've created. We, yes. we didn't used to have this much loneliness or stress. Neither are so are needed to the level they are at, but we've created it that way. And so again, that's why I think it's important to speak to these things that are alternatives to the way that most people live, because we don't need to be so lonely. We don't need to kind of have our own individual space. And, and I'm not knocking anyone who does it because I've lived alone a lot of my life and I like my own space sometimes. But it's like you said, you can still have your own space and live within community, live within an intentional housing place where you can share resources, you can share you know, connection and time with others, but still feel, feel a bit of autonomy. So I think people tend to have an all or nothing idea. We, we still kind of have this association, I think of communes with like a hippie commune where like everyone's yeah. naked yeah. or everyone's like, doesn't shower, <laughs> like whatever it is that we, these things stick so well, right? Like we get an idea in our head and it just stays, but that's not what it is anymore. I mean, you all are involved in something that's really just about people coming together and who are like-minded, who have similar intentions and values and want to share that and maybe save some money and have improved health through more connection and, you know, greater um, opportunity for growth. That was another point, Sid, that- Right, so there's two more that are my usual go-tos. I wanted to mention personal growth, but also the thing about conserving resources. We don't have to have an appliance and a, you know, the lawnmower and the vacuum cleaner for every person and heat this and cool this space and have, you know, a house or an apartment for one person. Um, Co-living in spaces that feel comfortable and having, you know, just economies of scale with the things that we buy, a lot smaller ecological footprint, and it can make one feel better and um, have more people doing things. It's like, okay, I don't need to handle that thing, but there's someone else who's doing the accounting. There's some people here who work in the garden and, you know, there's that interrelatedness of the tasks that we do. We can accomplish more for more people having the smaller footprint. And then lastly was personal growth. Um, is just so ongoing and and there's a lot of beautiful things about community but people come in with their um, projections and their ideals and you have to know you will need to be prepared for disagreements there will be differences of opinion there will be conflict so you have to always prepare how do i know myself better and how can i interact with other people better in a non-violent non-threatening way to resolve differences so difference is a beautiful thing. Diversity in all sorts of ways is gonna be part of um, shared living. And when you cooperate, people are just gonna have different ideas and preferences. So just wanted to highlight that, but you learn through other people bringing in traits and past histories, whether travel stories or different kinds of jobs or talents that they have, you know, musicianship, acting. I mean, you will meet people 
that you just haven't before and be able to get to know them well. And so that in itself brings personal growth, but resolving differences with someone that you live with and, and care about, especially um, really sink in to open your understanding, your heart and your mind to therefore be like more hopeful about peace and more a person who goes in the world knowing, hey, you know, I know how to resolve conflict. I know it's possible. So therefore it's like a, a piece of um, your part bringing a more peaceful world. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I, I think the personal growth is just so extensive, the amount you can have yeah. with others, because like any relation, any relationship, whether it's with your family or a, a partner or a community, there's no <laughs> greater ground for growth. Right. I mean, there's definitely there's growth we do within ourselves, that personal growth that we, you know, you got to go within. And that's very powerful. But when you're in relation to other people, it shows you things that you just can't see when you're by yourself. Right. Yes. And, oh, yeah. The mirror, <laughs> the reflection. Yeah. Like, you don't see yourself the way others. <laughs> yeah. When like if, if you're single for a long time, you might say like, oh, I'm doing really well and I've worked everything out. And then you get a partner and you're like, oh, my gosh, like I have these things that I still am struggling with and I didn't even realize it. The same with living with people. You might be like, yeah, I'm good when you live alone because you're not challenged by anything. You don't have someone that's kind of maybe pushing your boundaries or challenging the way you think. And all of a sudden you live with somebody and you're like, gosh, like I have a, there's a lot going on here. So I think it is a wonderful ground for, for growth and development. And with that said, I think that, you know, it's up to people to choose how long they want to be in community and maybe take some time to themselves for a while. Like, I think there's powerful growth in both, but if we never expose ourselves to other people's lifestyles and ideas mm -hmm. and values and just boundaries, then we're not really giving ourselves the opportunity to grow. So I think it is important. And even, even when things don't go well, like I had a house that fell apart, like it was still a great growth opportunity and an opportunity to sort of see how communication can break down and see how people are when they're under stress. And mm -hmm. You know, we'll we'll all be a little bit better at dealing with that when it happens again. Some because it always happens, you know. Uh, yeah. The, well, I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Zach. Because I think we don't want to make it all like rainbows and sunshine, right? That like everybody can just have, be on a farm or find a home and yeah. live happily ever after. It's life still. It's people. It's human personalities coming up against each other, and sometimes it doesn't work, and that's okay. Oh yeah, like you know. Uh, Intentional communities have their fair share of drama, just like any community. Like there's there's strife and struggle and conflict, but you know, at the end of the day, the most important part is to work it out and just keep talking with each other and being yeah. in relation. Do you mind sharing a little, Zach, about sort of, we don't have to go into too much detail, but just the idea of how did you know, like how did it come together and when did you guys realize this isn't gonna work? And did, were you able to go your separate ways like lovingly or was it was there any contention at the end? Like how did it sort of, work out oh, yeah I mean it was during COVID and like a lot of things during COVID it was about <laughs> COVID risk which is a challenging conversation of yeah. part of the house was cautious and another part was even more cautious uh one some of my housemates wanted to go to the the BLM protests in the the summer of 2020 and the others you know at that point we didn't know what large outdoor crowds would do so they uh you know didn't want that contingent to go and there ended up being some conflict over whether and how much they should go to those events and uh you know ultimately we we didn't work it out a out work it out to a way it could be amicable and the house ended up breaking apart which was sad but it happens and uh like i said it was good to see how people disagree and how you know really we should be talking about as much as we can beforehand and understanding how people will respond to stress and challenges and of course that's not always possible to vet someone thoroughly no one was expecting a pandemic but... no that flew through everyone for such a loop because who, we never had to think about these things before like yes. you know I mean, somebody... so now everyone's gonna think about like what if i were stuck with this person for you know 12 months inside and couldn't see anyone else yeah uh... yeah what about you sid have you ever been in a community that just wasn't it was, didn't turn out, or maybe your greatest success story and one of the ones that was more of a learning opportunity. Um, in an urban setting, 
the first place that I helped create community in Seattle was super fun. And it was at a time of life where um, one person owned the house and a couple of us lived there as renters. And we decided we're making it into a community. We gave it a name. We're going to make decisions collectively. And um, we wanted to physically expand. And the house did physically expand and then could invite more people to live there. Um, because of then aging into a place where um, those of us that lived there, um, well, I'll just, one person wanted to get married. And then once they were married and we invited another family that already had one child to live there, it became a different vibe slightly. And then ultimately one family moved out and it became just like um, the main uh, owner couple and her sister and her family. So you can see how like it adapted, it didn't fail exactly, um, but it wasn't, it didn't have the same dynamic and it wasn't a place that I ended up staying, but it just morphed. So that's a lot of times for homes that it's good for that set of people. And then one or two, they leave at times and then regroup and incorporate a new person and personality and, um, then sometimes it's just like one decides to move and then it's like a set of dominoes. Well, if you're leaving, then I guess we're all going to go and not going to do this experiment anymore, but it's all been a learning experience and, and we benefited while we were there. Yeah. I don't have really a super dramatic thing, but I was going to bring up related to COVID. Zach, did you have a, I mean, first of all, I want to applaud that people expressed their fears and their preferences, right? Rather than being silently resentful or trying to, you know, get outwardly angry, um, kick people out, prevent them from doing, you know, things, but at least they were trying to talk it out. Yes. So that's yeah, like- It was a very civil, you know, vigorous disagreement and we-, we uh... And did you have a chart? Were you exposed to something that was sort of like a one through five steps of risk tolerance? Oh yeah, I don't know if y'all saw the micro COVID tracker, but it it's calculates like percents of a chance that you'll get COVID from a certain activity. And okay, no, that's different than what I was thinking of. But anyway, there are tools like that, and cooperatives shared things. And NICA, just to recognize another Northwest Intentional Communities Association, and um, the Seattle Cooperative Housing Network is a small group that's somewhat related, but just a small subset because the other is a regional. Um, representing long-term nonprofit. And um, NICA had put out resources to its contacts, people on their newsletter list. How did other people make decisions when COVID came along? Here's some other tips about what to, uh, how to bring things up, what to talk about. And one of the things was a scale that helped people identify how much risk they were willing to take. And if you could get the you know household in this case, or community, like a co-housing community to agree, this is how we're gonna treat our bubble. This is how much, uh, you know, when do we go out to buy groceries or go to a store at all? Are we ordering in? Are we gonna have one person do it and we require that they wear gloves and masks, da, 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 da. you know, like we could make a policy that helps meet or pretty much help to lower the fears of those who have the least risk tolerance. And that was the challenge for all of us. And so sharing those tools was helpful. When I saw that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a helpful conversation tool, so. Yes, we, we sort of reinvented something a lot like that. But okay. you also bring up a, a very interesting topic of like, we've touched on this a little bit, but decision-making in intentional yeah. communities. You've talked about a consensus model. Uh, would you be willing to share more about some of the decision-making models you've seen and what you prefer? Yeah. Um, there's, gosh, there's so many different types depending on the size and the legal structure of the community. But I've been in where there's a planner manager system like at Twin Oaks. And this was modeled after um, Walden II a bit where there's different guilds and uh, work areas that have a manager. And then those managers that have similar uh, other kind of work areas, those managers are in a kind of council or a guild. And then for any decisions that are impacting the group but fall between the cracks, 
outside of those work groups or simply are not work related issues. There's um, overall policy makers that are called the planners and that's similar to having like a board uh, position on a nonprofit, I guess. And then there were things like budgeting where for 80 to 100 people, there would be a trade-off game every year that all people had the opportunity as members to participate in and look at how we might change the budget. So this is very participatory, democratic thing. Also the planners could also be like vetoed out by a member vote. Um, managers pretty much like you didn't get compensated more for doing it. So people were glad for rotating managerships, but for planners anyway, you couldn't do more than two planner terms together. Then you have to rotate out so that there wasn't any sort of centralized um, concentration of power in a person or a family. Sometimes, you know, um, that was one thing. Another thing has been using consensus in smaller groups where everyone, everyone is gonna sit and have a thing. Sometimes it's, uh, modified consensus in a lot of the co-housing groups. And then the new thing these last few years that's really been catching on is sociocracy. And it helps not even consensus. Um, it can be difficult for people to make time for meetings so much and for meetings to go on as long as they do and to get down to it. Um, consensus also is not complete um, unanimity, but it's trying to get a decision we can all live with. And it comes a lot from the Quaker tradition, but um, sociocracy has been sort of a fun and liberating, although albeit complicated and good to learn first before you just jump in and try to do it, um, form of good, uh, any kind of work group or uh, living together cooper cooperative group. Um, so there's a, a ton of things out there. If people just go look it up, there's different teachers, different books, and um, sometimes not where I've lived, but there's just like simply a voting thing like about making policy. There could be something where some people just have a committee or um, maybe even you know one leader whether that's politically elected or they've just started it and they keep that. Uh, role and then sometimes those certain policies they'll have a vote and it's just like you know numbers game whereas consensus is getting away from having winners and losers you know it's like we use when we use the typical voting and just looking for majority to win then that's always super contentious there's like just this divided team that wins and team that loses. So anyway, a lot of community living folks try to get away from that and be more creative, more participatory and um, look for the uh, best common denominator that we can live with, but others have the freedom to also, um, you know, either not participate in making that happen or, you know, we try to, we just, it's, we have to try to accommodate that's it's a creative challenge of governance, living in community, for sure. Yeah. Um, have you seen anything that worked or particularly didn't work in co-ops that you've been a part of or um, just observed, Zach, is it kind of like one dominant? There's also just to point out if there is a difference in you're living with a mixture of owner or owners mm -hmm. and then renters, there's gonna be some arena of things that the owners will make that the members don't have or shouldn't have a say in. You know, just like same thing, this, we wanna incorporate everybody, but someone who just showed up and hasn't read the policy or hasn't um, been part of meetings before about like a particularly controversial issue, probably they shouldn't speak up or think they have an absolutely equal voice in the decision-making meeting that's gonna be about that issue. So that's, you know, being sensitive to that and, and having good facilitators and mediators that can jump in. But anyway, like I'm jumping on the question I asked you, anything you saw that worked well or didn't, didn't work that was had to do with governance? Yeah, I think among a lot of the, you know, mid twenties, early thirties, younger folks I've seen in intentional housing, uh, consensus-based decision-making has been very popular recently. I haven't heard as much about sociocracy. I'm kind of curious about that, but uh, all of the communities I've lived in have been small enough to use consensus making and it's worked pretty well for us. Uh, I think this is a place where 
values can come into play as well. Uh, consensus gets a lot easier when you have a shared set of values. Um, my house, for example, is mostly vegetarian and vegetarian aligned. So even some people eat a little bit of fish, you know, we're not very um, uh, judgmental about it. Like everyone thinks that reducing meat consumption is good for the planet, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um, but even with that belief, with that common belief, uh, it makes cooking and grocery shopping and all of those right. things just sort of fall into place a little bit easier. Like there is sort of a natural consensus around less meat consumption and you know respect for the cooking areas and all of that uh, because we have these shared values. So Has I there been conflict about what pans you use or? No, it... no, no pan conflicts, no, nothing like that. Okay. Uh, but you know, I. I think that uh, establishing that clear set of values, like you said, upfront and, and having a clear, you know, mission and, and sense of what the community is yeah. about uh, can really pave the way for whatever decision making systems you have later on, if you do have. Uh, yeah, you have to make a choice about what you will use for your group decision making. That is a most yeah. important choice that one should make early on. Otherwise, there's a non-named but always in effect some sort of um, influence that is going on and and decisions are going to be made more are going to be like on the fly and up to the individuals and it's what we call um, the tyranny of structurelessness mm. when you do not even know what is our group decision making mode and model and how do we practice it and give the tools and you know training if need be some sort of background for everyone new to the group to understand how we're doing this how can you bring something up how can you get something changed or ask permission for something otherwise that's a big power imbalance well based on that i would ask do you do you all think that it's because i was talking to a friend once and we we're talking about can you have a, a living, a communal, a community, a commune without a leader? Can you just have like total equal? Because I think, you know, human history would show us that humans coming together will always form some type of hierarchy. But is that no. like, that's true? No, that's not true. And I think if you go back far enough that really human ecology shows us, um, it's my belief that we had more egalitarian societies earlier on and even though people had different skills and traits, people could still be equally valued for that. You know, you could have a society or let's just bring it down to village size so we can like maybe comprehend it better. The culture in this village is that yes, um, men may be doing some hunting and women might be doing gathering and it's a way to do like more of the childcare and, um, but if there is some division of labor, it doesn't have to mean that these are lesser valued and these are more valued as a structural thing. But sometimes it is easy to see that people try to consolidate power. Um, anyway, I don't wanna to go too deep into that, but I, the short answer is um, there can be shared power and not any one particular leader or a small handful of a couple people that remain leaders of a community throughout time is exactly what I was saying for like the Federation of Egalitarian Communities. They make that, you know, an absolute foremost value is that we all own the resources equally. The land is owned equally. We all get the same kind of compensation or allowance. Nobody makes more than another person. Um, we all have, you know, a choice in what kind of work we do and nobody is our boss per se. Um, we don't have leaders that stay in a role. We are rotating out and out, there's checks and balances within that system. So many examples that exist throughout time, but even right now, people who were raised in a hierarchical culture can learn how to share power, express needs and work with other people so that there's not uh, systemic domination and hierarchy. Thank you. And it's really good to know that 
there's examples of that, I think, and to untangle if there is sort of a dominance in any group. There's, it's not that there's, you know, some people we value in this culture, in the mainstream US culture, we value people who are white, well-educated. I'm not saying we as individuals here, but I'm saying that the way that things are getting rewarded in the mainstream culture is if you're educated, if you're articulate, if you're extroverts are valued more than introverts. Um, if you can, uh, if you're an English speaker and you speak it well and, you know, la, 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 la. There's a lot of things that can give someone a high value in any group. And so even a group of three or four or five, someone may appear dominant in, again, like just taking a snapshot and someone who is like, okay, I have an idea, we're gonna do it this way. And they can propose something, but in an ongoing way, if that group is living together, there may be many other ways which they value each other, they balance out, there's checks and balances about that one person who spoke up in the snapshot may not be dominant in all areas at all times. And if they want to be more egalitarian, they can give feedback to that person to say, why don't you wait and not speak first? Let's ask for everyone else. Let's have a facilitator in this group and ask for input from people we haven't heard from yet. Or those sort of things that help to let people again on an individual and psychological level realize, oh, I guess I'm used to just speaking up and getting my way. Oh, I get feedback from the group that says, maybe I should wait. And then if no one else says it, I can give this idea that I have and see if the group likes it, but not assume that it's the right way, the only way, and it's my way or the highway. Yeah. And I feel like that's another benefit of a community is you, people may um, find their voice, learn how to have a voice. Whereas oh, absolutely. some people are used to just being really passive and they're like, I'll do whatever my family wants to do i'll just go along with it and but when you're you know you're a member of a a community you matter and your voice matters and you're a part of it and you can't just kind of step back and what you know the way that you're describing it, and i think of it in a bigger scale you know the us in general i think a lot of people have become very passive and felt very dis feel very disempowered Indeed. when it comes to bigger decisions and at this point a lot of people are even like oh i'm i don't why even vote why even do anything it doesn't matter mm -hmm. everything's going to keep going the way it's going and that's that's a really concerning thing because everybody matters every individual matters but when you feel like you don't yeah. people step back they lose their voice right if we give up then we can blame someone else for how everything goes and I had to learn that lesson that in my 20s, when I went to live in community on a larger scale, I realized I really had not learned to ask for what I wanted. And I learned it, I got lessons over and over again. Oh, 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 <laughs> you know, to realizations that totally shaped my personality and my direction in life by living in community and understanding like, um, we all come there with our baggage and we all have lessons to learn. I think that's one of the great things about community. In, in addition to, to practicing your voice is hearing other people's voices and sort of being exposed to uh, people who might have different life histories than you and life experiences and you know how that's shaped their daily living preferences. And that's how it comes out, right? Because you know someone doesn't like the TV on for some reason. Right. And then you learn about their family history. And why? You're about, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then it provides that opportunity to dig in. And because you're living together, you do have this common ground and you, you already have something in common. You have a reason to, to work it out and figure it out. Because, you know, a lot of the time, if you go to a bar or a club or whatever, or some sort of other ways that we have of socializing, if you don't like someone, you can just leave. You don't have to interact with it. You don't have to work it out. You can just go home your single apartment and like never get to the root of the disagreement uh but in a living situation it's a lot harder to just walk away and you can't you can always leave but then you have to find somewhere new to live and you know all the all the benefits of the community i think are, are great for encouraging people to really you know dig in and get to know each other and uh, find ways of resolving things yeah and again i, I see the parallel between you know, communal living and a relationship and that communication is always key, right? Communication is going to be the thing that makes or breaks an interaction. But then there's also that fine line between just as you said, Zach, you 
so often we just, we've learned to just walk away from something that's not exactly how we want it. It's not easy. It's a little bit tough. So we're like, eh, I'll just move on or I'll just keep to myself and won't bother with, with that. But then there's also a line of maybe this isn't going to work, right? Because mm -hmm. we've all been in relationships where it's like, okay, I'm going to fight for this. I'm going to work really hard. But then you realize, actually, I think it's just not a very healthy connection. It's not, it's too misaligned. It's just not, not all relationships are going to work. As you described earlier, not all housing situations will work. So, but it's taking that time to recognize and kind of feel out if I'm voicing myself effectively, if I'm using communication, is that being reciprocated? Is everybody doing that? Because if it's not, then it might not work out. But if people can, because when you said like getting to the root of the problem, it takes everyone to get to the root of a problem. I know that I've been in a living situation where one person wasn't willing to, to share like what their, their deeper issue with something was, right? Like you said, like the TV thing or somebody's, you know, getting really frustrated with certain stuff. If they're not willing to kind of sit down and discuss it, communicate, you're kind of left with one person who's really just sort of checked out from the community and that's not going to work. Right. There were a couple of things in there that um, prompted comment. Like I was saying, we learn to use our voice, but also um, there's some people who can come across as just teacherly or a complaining nag all the time. So I also recommend people pick their battles and be prepared to forgive. And sometimes the things that communities fight over are dishes, dogs, and paint colors, whatever. That's like the go-to places. And um, there's going to be an occasion, even me, maybe I've left something in the sink. Usually, uh, you know, I've lived in houses. The policy is like, we don't leave dishes sitting out. But if someone has like left it by the side of the sink or left a pan on the stove or their glass is sitting here, didn't get in the dishwasher, like, do we really have to have a whole conflict resolution over that? Like, just take care of it for them. Do an extra dish, take the extra step, maybe mention it to them if it's something chronic that really bothers you. Maybe you're the only one that bothers. Maybe they want to leave it out because they're going to use that glass again today. But it's all of that stuff, like over one little thing, some people can walk away because it's like, oh, it's not a good fit for me. This doesn't feel healthy. They're not doing what they said they're going to do. And, and then just leave. And then they never get the opportunity to have that full disclosure, working it out, have some hopefully feeling of healing and resolution and have that tool to go on for the rest of their lives to know that they have tools for utilizing conflict effectively and getting a good result. Anyway, yeah. I see that a lot. Yeah. Thank you for that. So then on that same note, so that's sort of like the more simplified version of you know just normal everyday stuff that comes up in intentional communities. What are some of the, what goes on in an intentional community? Because I, again, I feel like some people just picture like a farmhouse and people are raising animals and everything, but in a basic communal housing, what are some of the basic tenants that you practice? Like Sid, I know just being with your home, you said once, uh, once a week, everybody does cooks dinner for everyone. And you know, you all, you have a shared kitchen space, you have your own room. So what are, what are some basics that people tend to incorporate in a communal housing environment? That's intentional. I'll start it a little bit, but I want Zach to comment too. Um, like a lot of times in a student co-op, they have a chore wheel. It's like, oh my God, do you guys use a chore wheel? Um, we don't in this household. We have things that we we do, like you say, um, take a turn and cook once a week. If we're around, there's exceptions, right? Um, but we usually prefer to do some things in an ongoing way and there's not a constant rotation. Some people are gonna be better at doing certain things. Some people like or are willing to do certain things that others are not. So to enforce an absolute rotation sometimes is inefficient and just a downer, I don't know. And so um, there's different ways to work that out, but everyone, you need to work out chores. Sometimes inside the house, plus we have a yard um, and, so yard and garden things and trees and picking up the apples that fall and someone I'm so grateful for, you know, arranged that city fruit came to pick some of the fruit. And then if there's still extra, there's some people that come and pick up apples for cider pressing because we can't use them all. And uh, yeah, so it's, there's always things to do. And so being um, part of a, a discussion where labor uh, feels somehow equitable, even though it might not be a chore wheel. And then um, who shops 
and you know, I have a car and I shop and other people don't have a personal car. And so they'll put things on a list. And do I resent it that I'm doing the shopping for things that other people said they want? No, no. I mean, I'm going to do that. And then there's other people that are going to clean some things more than I do either. Cause I don't notice it or they just are very, uh, focused on it and and that's their routine so I just am trying to say there's different ways to approach it but if one person is picking up after another or there's one person who's you know slacking a lot then that will create conflict and it's good to probably you know try just speaking to them about it first uh, or bringing it up in a group meeting and and then they can think about creatively how they can do that instead so Zach, what's an example for yours with some of the routine things? Oh yeah, I mean, I feel like in general for community housing, you talk about chores and that's definitely a big part of it, but uh, the bi-weekly, weekly or monthly house meeting, like if you go to almost any intentional community, <laughs> yeah, like, they'll have a house meeting, they'll have the house meeting where you like talk about issues or chores or whatnot. Yeah, you have to have a little set aside time for business meeting. It's not just in passing and over the coffee, but yeah, so yeah, yeah. how often do you guys have it? Uh, we actually don't have one. This is the one oh, I have. Oh right my now. goodness. Very strange. But uh, one of the things I also wanted to talk about, which is more on the fun side, because we haven't talked, we've talked okay. about the chores and the housework and that's important, but it's not like the, yeah. you know, I'm not in intentional communities. To What's the chores. glue? What's the bonding um, part? Yeah. We, we used to do like a weekly house dinner where we would rotate cooking. Everyone would get together. We would spend time together. Uh, that was really great. Um, and in terms of things, uh, that we do together besides that there's like we've done movie nights there's uh, -huh. uh sometimes we'll just wind up in the kitchen eating breakfast at the same time and we'll just hang out and chat parallel working is great uh I don't know if y'all have talked much about parallel play of like where you're just doing things on your own around other people uh you know I feel like meal times again we've talked about loneliness and about isolation uh, I think that comes up a lot with at meal times where people you know in the evening either have to eat alone or like going out with friends or if you have a significant other then you like eat all your meals with your significant other and that's great you know uh having deep connections with people is, is excellent but uh i do think intentional communities like we've been saying like offer the opportunity to like share this very fundamental part of being human with right. other people um and yeah i think that's that's a big part of it is the eating together and the you know relaxing together relaxing in the same space whether you're having conversations as a group or just all being in the living room at the same time yeah it is and we do that here because of the fact that it's not only the person's like commitment to cook but then because a meal is offered five times a week we actually make an effort to show up when a meal is being served even if it's not the person's like you know, someone has a very different schedule. So like in this house, he might've just had breakfast an hour or two ago. He's not ready for dinner, but we make the effort if you're around to come and sit and socialize and we check in and often we'll resolve things that other people would save up for a business meeting. So if we need it, um, we will meet once a month, but a lot of times it ends up being like, oh, well, there's nothing really important on the agenda or nothing at all. So do we want to play a card game or do we want to just hang out or yeah, there's, it's important to just have um, a fun time together and, and to balance that with like, are we talking about what we need to? Okay, if that's done, then let's play. Let's have fun, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I sort of wanted to add on, like you mentioned, like introverts can also be intentional community. My current house is four introverts and one extrovert. So like, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, I, I think really what we're sort of getting at here is that intentional communities don't mean you have to socialize. It just makes it socialization more available. It's easier mm -hmm. to do. Uh, there's a big difference between, you know, like driving 20 minutes to see a friend and say walking 20 minutes to see a friend. And just like that, there's a big difference between walking 20 minutes and if you just step outside your bedroom or like go down the hall in an apartment and there are people and they're socializing, uh, it lets you sort of fill that need on your own schedule and not have to, to plan and like schedule these blocks of time when you have to socialize. 
Yeah. It will be a lot more flexible. And in a household for uh, those of us that are single, and this is a point where I think it would be good for maybe bringing up kids and family stuff. But um, if you don't have a family that you're near or live with, um, living cooperatively is always a help, whether that's household size or, you know, 75, 80 people that when someone has a health crisis or just an appointment, you probably can get someone to help you out and give you a ride. If someone has injured themselves or they have a mental health crisis, this has happened in a large community for me, um, you can have a whole health team to check in with that person and be regularly, you know, um, making sure they have their meds or they have meals brought to them and they have all that thing. Yeah. So whatever it is, like community has an ethic of usually rallying around crisis, whatever is needed. But um, yeah, Zach, um, maybe to even close out soon, what's been the experience? um, I mean, I've experienced on large and small scales of community under one roof or community in a kind of larger village of 400 and some acres. So um, there's, I've witnessed child programs um, and having kids, some of them, you know, homeschooled or the preschoolers all be raised in like a children's house and not living in nuclear family homes and units at all. Um, And then, like I said, one of the places where I first lived in Seattle and started community, it was first three single people, then another person, then one got married and they started having kids. So they had two kids and we invited a family and then had one and then later a second kid. And so it all worked out. It certainly can, but what are the issues or things to just kind of be aware of with the concept of family and um, intentional cooperative living unrelated people? Yeah, I mean, I I want kids someday and I think the way we do, the way we do childbearing, like a lot of other things, uh, these days has some some challenges. Uh, like I think it's it's really hard for two people to raise a kid on their own. Like it takes a lot of work. I watched my parents, you know, sac- sacrifice a lot of their free time and socializing to to raise the kids. Uh, and I don't think that's good for the parents or the kids in general. Some people can pull it off. Some people can make it work. But I think for most people, it's very hard. And having kids in community lets you get a lot of support. I'm sure you've seen this in practice that it lets the parents or the people raising the kids get a lot more support. Yes. Of like even the housemates who like might not want to take care of the kids directly, you know, can still like cook a little more, or clean a little more, or help, you know, take over in an emergency or like the parents will like take the kids somewhere and the other housemates will just keep the house running. Um, yeah. That's what really appeals to me. I think it's also good for kids too to have uh relationships with adults that are not their parents on their own terms and like sort of be able to explore that um and just like yeah learn that everyone's different learn that everyone has a different style and uh have relationships again the 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 thing about not having relationships with other adults is that there's less um pressure involved like it's i'm sure everyone has had like when you're kids sometimes that it's easier to talk to adults who aren't your parents because you know, they, you can tell them things. You can complain about right. your parents to other adults. It's hard to complain to your parents as a kid. Um, and that sort of, those independent relationships I think are really valuable. And again, a lot easier when everyone's living together or nearby, or there's this ethos of community and uh, the kids have time to spend with other people. Yeah, kids. yeah, that was one of the draws for me personally to live in the Twin Oaks community that um, there was an opportunity for people who weren't biological parents to interact with kids voluntarily. And you pick different shifts, different age groups and be able to interact either with groups of kids or also there was a like a one-on-one thing that I could be, I'd have one evening a week where I had a special relationship and would spend like from dinner time to bedtime with one little girl and um, either take her back to a parent at the end of the night or put her to bed. Usually she was small enough at that time, it was just taking her back to her mother. Um, But yeah, learning some skills and deciding, you know, as a young person, is this something that I do wanna do, you know, to either adopt or to have a child of my own um, biologically, but you have the less pressure on parents just having to deal with the kid at all times 
also the healthy kind of thing for the child to have more models of what are people like? What are adults doing in the world and different personalities and works, work that they do, um, things that they can bring to the game. And, and so, yeah, it's just the volunteerism of people who wanna spend time with kids when they want to and give um, a break to the parents to be choosing some more of their activities in a diverse way than just being daddy or mommy all the time. I do love the, the way of putting it. It's not all or nothing. You can have a little bit of kids or more kids. Or not. Yeah, I think that's such a wonderful point, Zach. And thank you for bringing it up because I, that's kind of like loneliness and stress. This is another thing that we've really put upon ourselves is that when we become our, a parent, we are signing ourselves over to a 24-7 job. And I have a lot of friends at this point in my life who have had families and some of them, it, they take to it well and they enjoy it. Others feel really overwhelmed and they, you know, it's not, it's, it's a lot for them and it's not really what they wanted. And, it, and it's, they mm -hmm. feel like it's, um, you know, they're not able to kind of pursue the things they wanted to do because it, it feels like it is, it totally falls on their shoulders. And the most that are, you know, most people in our society do is maybe like your, your parents, right? It's so like the grandparents will help out, but we don't have a lot of community-based or, you know, the organizations where people are families come together. And like you said, so like how wonderful that people in a community could meet with the, with other people's children once in a while. And it's more of a collaborative effort rather than just this mentality that this is our child. So we are the sole bearers of this child to raise them. Yeah. And that's, and that also is, you know, I mean, I'm a therapist, so I see we're all impacted by our childhoods and mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's inevitable. However, I think the degree to which most of us are impacted and affected in not the most positive ways by our childhood is because of this mentality that we're stuck with our parents and our parents are supposed to know everything and be able to do everything. Well, no parent is able to do that. Right. Right. So then they're, they're a role model. model, but they're not the end all be all. Yeah. And so then inevitably our, you know, the child is affected by that, impacted by it, disappointed in some ways. And it's created this cycle that's just really not beneficial to anyone. So I think the more that we can move towards this idea that yes, we, you know, we give birth to a child, we're going to be feel connected to it, but it doesn't mean that we're the sole people to only raise and impact that child. Yeah. And I think that communal living is a great way to start the way that you described it, Sid, Doc, the way that you described it is we got to start somewhere because right now we, I think people feel very stuck the way things are. This is how it is just how it's always going to be. Not true. Everything's yeah. changing all the well, time. Well, and a, one thing that's not going to be the way it has been is the climate and ecology of yeah. what we're able to grow and that there is a limit to growth, there's a limit to resources. And so if there were ever a time to consider building skills in cooperation and sharing, it's now when we're really reaching a height of climate crisis that's could be, you know, catastrophic. And so when real crises come and, um, some decision-making with confidence and experience of how to resolve conflicts or share resources, it's gonna be a very valuable tool to have a little bit of a notion of where to go and proceed. Yeah, I think you both might have more, more people coming, to wanting to connect with you and learn more information because I think that humans tend to not do anything until they have to, especially stuff like this, where it's about sort of more an, an expansive, a more conscious way of living a lot of people will, will not do it until they have to, but we, we are reaching that point where we're going to have to start acting and thinking differently because we're just not going to have, people are being displaced. People are being uprooted. Things are, it's, we're seeing it now and it's only yeah. going to continue. So yeah. that's why I think that I thank you so much, both of you for being on the show. That's why I think these conversations are so important because, you know, the time is coming where this isn't just like a, you know, an alternative way of living. It's going to be more incorporated into the most effective. How do we survive? Yeah, absolutely. So on that note, where, how do people find, if they want to get more involved in intentional communities, if they want to check where, where are my intentional communities in my area? Is there a network for that? Is there a way to find that? How can people learn more? I really wish that in all major cities, they had a hub that just existed of shared living resources. Now in some mm -hmm newspapers used to list it that way that you know room in shared 
houses. Um, since I don't know, I haven't looked online at if they have classifieds that way. Um, we've turned to Facebook in Seattle where we have the Seattle Cooperative Housing Network. I know that there are some resources people can just do like a web search for their area and see cooperative living, shared living, shared housing, those kind of words and see what they can come up with. Sometimes it'll show up on Craigslist. Sometimes it'll be some other hub that exists. There are other things like Silver Nest for people over 50 looking to share their homes or find cooperative housing. There's um, Sharing Housing is the name of a actual nonprofit based out in the East Coast that I talked about FIC, Foundation for Intentional Community. The website for that is ic.org for intentional community. And um, in our area, this region, the Pacific Northwest has NICA, Northwest Intentional Communities Association. And the website is nwcommunities.org. Um, Zachary, yeah, think like of others. You hit a lot of notes, but I will note that um, i would looked at moving to Denver and the San Francisco Berkeley area. And both of those areas also had Facebook groups. So I'm optimistic that in a lot of major cities, if you, you might need to play around with the keywords a little bit about intentional communities, cooperative housing, cooperative living, uh, there's often a Facebook group. Right. And there's more opportunities for agents who are um, realtors and brokers to help you with co-buying housing. We have a group that's called Co-Buy Seattle, and they exist in at least one other city. There's also, I need to mention, because right now, Zach and I are both renters. So we're thinking about cooperative living that is not necessarily an ownership stake, or um, there is a different legal definition of a co-op, but we're not really addressing that. We're just looking at cooperative living, cooperative culture, shared housing. Mm -hmm. And um, for those people who have the ability to buy into a co-housing community, look at co-housing US. And that, I think it's probably a .org, co-housing US, and, uh, or just do a search for it, that they have so many all over every state in the US and in other countries abroad. So if you're looking to rent or to buy, to visit, to experiment, there's also one more, the FEC that I mentioned, Federation of Egalitarian Communities. Their website is the FEC. So the FEC.org. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you for those resources. Thank you both so much for joining me today and sharing about your wealth of knowledge around co-housing, intentional communities, the wave of the future, the, what we're moving into. And thanks for being a, a resource for people to learn more about this. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. All right, thank you. So I'll see you in a few minutes. Downstairs. Okay, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> All right.